Tutors, crypto, tutors, hey. It's a way. Making money in my sleep? Making money in my sleep. <laughs> of course, we had to kick it off with the Crypto Tutor song. Welcome to the Crypto Tutor Show, where you'll learn how to earn from subject matter experts and trailblazers who are leading us into the future on the crypto couch. I'm Lisa Francoeur, aka Fancy Five, and I'm a co founder at Crypto Tutors, where our mission is to simplify cryptocurrency through e-learning and one-on-one -on -one tutoring to transform knowledge into wealth. Being that the future is now, let me take a moment to intro Casimir Patterson, a force to be reckoned with in general, but particularly within the crypto arena. Welcome Casimir, it's great to have you. Thanks for having me. Let me tell you why Casimir is a force to be reckoned with. An engineer by trade, a pioneer in the world of NFTs, which stands for non-fungible tokens. Yeah, you heard it. Non-fungible tokens, which is the main focus of today's conversation. Casimir, I hope I did you justice. You tell me. Yeah, it's perfectly correct. I wanted to first say thanks for having me on the show and I'm really excited to be a part of Crypto Tutors and yeah, just really excited for this experience. Well, you know, our goal is to bring subject matter experts to really help simplify crypto. And today we're sort of deviating from the, the cryptocurrency conversation to focus on non-fungible tokens. And before I think we go there, can you explain what's, what does non-fungible even mean? So the difference between like a Bitcoin and a token or a non-fungible token is that non-fungible tokens represent unique assets that can also represent physical assets as well. And that's the main differentiating factor between NFTs and coins. Okay, so give me an example of an NFT. So um, some examples of what can be made into an NFT is um, sneakers, uh, for example, with sneaker cred, we tokenized um, the sneakerhead culture and created um, about three different drops of um, sneaker collectibles, digital collectibles. Um, another example is artwork, digital art. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really huge burgeoning market because it's essentially, it's a new genre of art making. Um, NFTs as digital artworks are creating this new space where memes, um, intersect with um, AR, VR, XR, and um, AR, other... augmented reality, VR, yeah. virtual reality, and XR. XR is like the emergent of physical space, but being able to inter interact with a virtual object in that in that space in that in that area between so, like digital and physical. Okay, so so this is really fascinating because you know the the NFT industry is really gaining traction. I was just reading that um, an artist named Beeple literally sold his digital work for something like three point five or so million dollars. So clearly, this isn't like you know a new thing as much as it is a thriving thing, you know, like we talk about the future being now. And I think that that's a good example. Can you tell us a little bit about what crossing that threshold meant for the NFT community? Yeah, so um, people, he did a really cool drop uh, with Nifty Gateway. And, and when you say drop, you mean like a release? Yeah, like a release. So yeah, like okay. in the NFT space, we call them drops. Um, so what was cool about Beeple's drop is that he actually offered a physical object, a physical thing that you could, you know, have in reality, along with the, the digital collectible. So that was really unique. I think that's where the space is moving forward. We're still pretty early on and, um, you know, folks that are early adopters are really um, part and parcel of like moving the space forward um, with the amount of creativity that they're bringing to the table. 
You know, what's also fascinating about this space is that, you know, we're still, it's, it's January, 2021, and we're still in the midst of the pandemic and, you know, art galleries, I mean, you know, physical spaces is not something that, you know, we have the luxury of, of, you know, being in anymore for the foreseeable future. So this presents a great alternative, you know, because having another way to monetize your work is really critical as an artist. And so I'm curious from you and, and the work that you're doing at, at Sneaker Cred, right? Like how you have, you have your own marketplace at Sneaker Cred? Is it safe to say that? Yeah, what we do um, is basically we have a storefront and that storefront allows you to interact with other marketplaces such as mm -hmm. OpenSea, um, Known Origin. We did a drop with Cargo.Build and all these different marketplaces offer users the opportunity to um, buy and sell and trade and auction um, digital collectibles. And if folks want to see your collectibles, because you guys have, you know, sneakers, they're like, they're renderings of, um, you know, different sneaker collections, and you incorporate um, even cryptocurrencies, like I think the last collection I saw, you were paying like homage to Ethereum, the Ethereum coin, it was like Ethereum line. Yeah, yeah, we did a, a Ethereum, so it's a play on Ethereum, so we called it the Ethereum, and yeah, we did a drop um, with unique um, digital collectibles based upon sneaker culture and street culture mashups, and I play sports in college, so we use like NCAA colorways, um, we also use like NFL and, and NBA colorways as well, and it actually like spawned a, a bidding war, in fact, and uh, some of our early adopters, they they bought on the first day. They were actually like pre-sold. So we had a test net and then we sold $100,000 on the test net. And then those people who were on the test net, they were biting at the bit, waiting for us to do our first drop. And when we did our first drop, um, they were selling is, out. Excuse me, is, is test net, would you say like beta? Like before you, you went? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's like before you actually go on the main net. So that's another terminology in, in um, the blockchain spaces. There's test nets and then there's main net. So main net is where you can actually purchase them with Ethereum or um, you know a stable coin and something like that. Okay. And so on the main net, that's where cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, for instance, can be used to acquire these, these digital assets. Yeah. Okay. But on the test net, when you were, um, you know, just kind of, I guess you could say, testing the waters, yep. you saw that there was a real appetite for the, yep. the collection. Because you said it was something like 100,000. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, we sold about 100,000 on the test net, which is just like test net money. Um, so if, if you want to work on something, you can actually use the test net and it'll give you test net um, ether from the Ethereum faucet. Okay, and so testnet ether is that um, you know is is that like monopoly money? <laughs> it's kind of like you can call it that. You can call it that. <laughs> because I'm thinking like, okay, is is that something that you can uh, convert to to uh, an actual currency, or is that just something to kind of again just uh, just see how you know yep. how exactly. well it might perform? You got it. Okay, dope. I think what's interesting about the world of NFTs and um, what you're doing is, again, right? We're talking about how long is how long is an NFT been around? Let me let me take a step back and just kind of start from the beginning. So there's a book um, that OpenSea's founder um, put out called the NFT Bible, and it actually talks about how um, the idea or concept of digital collectibles um, came about, and then ultimately. I believe around 2016, 2017 is when the um, ERC-721 standard for NFTs came about. And um, shortly after that, you know, really huge um, NFT companies like Dapper Labs created CryptoKitties and they notoriously um, bloated the Ethereum blockchain and so forth. And there's been other um, companies too, like Avastars, they offered the opportunity to collect a unique avatar on the blockchain. Yeah. 
Um, and then there's other companies too, like Engine Coin. They um, created the ERC 1155 standard, which allows for gaming assets to be bought and sold from a single smart contract. Now that's very interesting because the Engine token, right? was recognized recently by the Japanese government as a actual like form of currency. And I think this is fascinating because they're the first token in history to be recognized by a, a government entity. And Japan has always been on the vanguard, especially when it comes to like, um, you know, the gaming industry and whatnot. But it's so fascinating to see how, you know, NFTs are beginning to be adopted, not just by early, you know, not, not just by, you know, individuals who are artists themselves and are looking for ways to monetize their art, but also, you know, government entities are starting to recognize the value. Yeah, I think ultimately, you know, people want to participate in the metaverse. And that's what we're contributing to is the building of the metaverse. And wait, 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 the metaverse. You know, my mind and whomever's watching this is like metaverse. I can barely figure out what the universe means. So let's <laughs> pause and let's wind, run it back, run it back, run it back. What is the metaverse? So the metaverse is this idea that you can interoperate between multiple different gaming universes and those gaming console universes can interact and you can take your avatars um items uh virtual currency game skins and um boosts and points and basically like a character avatar you built into multiple different um virtual game and domains so does that mean that i can take you know um my avatar from like xbox and i can i can um it's it's portable so i can drop it into another gaming console that's correct My, microsoft actually has a um blockchain um division and they're implementing that on the xbox that that's correct so what role do you think that the metaverse is going to play in just helping to create a more um a more maybe like independent, a more, you know. Equitable. I think it's ultimately gonna offer opportunities to esports gamers, to people who um, participate in like cell phone games to actually earn a living, to actually like, you know, turn those eight to however many hours you put in on your gaming console into, um, you know, virtual currency that you can cash out. So for all of the gamers out there whose parents keep telling them that uh, you're wasting your time, tell them, no, no. If you step into the metaverse, then you'll see how lucrative things could be. <laughs> and even before you yeah, step into and... the metaverse, like the truth is gaming is, uh, is, is almost a billion dollar business in and of itself. E-sports, e e-game, e-sports. Yeah, e-sports is a burgeoning industry that is ripe for innovation in the blockchain space. Um, there's a lot of different gaming platforms like the Sandbox for one. Um, they have a blockchain integration. Uh, there's Axie Infinities that operate on the Loom network. They use the ERC-721X standard. And um, I think ultimately it's the perfect um, marriage of gaming and blockchain technology. Now, I don't know much about the standards that you're referencing, but again, just in getting prepared to kind of have this conversation with you, what I think is very interesting about the uh, Axie Infinity, um, Axie Infinity, um, the, the blockchain game, Axie Infinity, was Delphi Digital, which is a crypto research firm. So they're not even art collectors. What they did was they bought five Ethereum NFTs. Now, keep in mind, these were like digital pets. These were like actual pets within um, within the game that sold for one hundred and sixty two thousand dollars. And they did that because they could see the value of the pets increasing because of their their utility, their popularity, et cetera. So we're not just talking about like, you know, following Pokemon around the world. That's correct. I think ultimately, you know, the interoperability of blockchains, not only Ethereum, but there's also EOS and the WAX uh, platform. 
Um, there's other interoperable um, NFTs like Cosmos. They have an NFT module. Um, I might go really far, further into, you know, blockchain land and talk about Polkadot, Substrate. Um, and then there's also the Flow blockchain that's built by Dapper Labs with um, the NBA Top Shot game that's pretty pretty popular with the folks who Yes, here. I feel like I need a, a translator here to explain to me what you're talking about when you talk about the different blockchains and everything. So before we even get into that, tell me a little bit about like blockchain. Like, like how would you define blockchain? So, five um, so yeah, the way that I try to conceptualize blockchain for folks is like an Excel spreadsheet, right? Mm -hmm. Like imagine you have an Excel spreadsheet where you keep track of your records. And then that, that record is um, publicly available on this blockchain and everybody can rectify it. So I'll use music for example, because it's an industry that's ripe with um, inequity in terms of artist compensation. And a lot of that um, inequity comes from the fact that the accounting that takes place in these Excel spreadsheets isn't readily available, not even to the artists themselves. And ultimately, um, something like blockchain technology that offers this open ledger gives artists the opportunity to um, you know, audit their profits that they've actually made. And they don't have to um, most famously do what a chameleon did, which was hire the, um, the lawyer of Jay-Z, who was also the lawyer of Michael Jackson in order to do um, complete auditing of their books. The record labels. I love the fact that we're putting power back into the hands of, of the people, right? Like, I think that's been one of the challenges across all industries, having quote unquote subject matter experts that pay, that charge you a premium to, to you know, ensure that, you know, your, your books are balanced, uh, the ledger is balanced and so forth. And, you know, I think with the work that you're doing at, uh, you know, um, the work that you're doing in general within the NFT world, like you're really making it accessible to the masses because you also have a, a, a class, I guess you would call it. Um, you have a class on Clubhouse every Tuesday at um, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern. I don't yes. know what time it is specific to your research. Um, you, have a, you have a talk on uh, Clubhouse where you start to introduce folks at whatever level they are to, to the world of NFTs. Yeah, we call it deciphering crypto. Um, mm -hmm. So we do deciphering crypto talks every Tuesday at 10 a.m. CST. And then shortly after that, I offer a 30 minute deep dive session um, with about four students that whoever emails me on Twitter or uh, DMs me, uh, they get to sign up and I throw you into the deep end of the pool. And then I watch you struggle and then I throw you a floaty device and then you can float back to the side at the end. That was probably the easiest thing that you said this entire conversation. <laughs> no, um, you know, I actually enrolled in your, in, in your course. And, you know, honestly, although I didn't understand because I don't, I'm not a coder, I'm not an engineer, although I didn't understand all of the intricacies, what I will say is that you gave me a lot of, you inspired me to want to learn more. And I think that if nothing else, being inspired to want to learn more because truth be told each of us has to do our own due diligence and thankfully we have you know folks like yourself Casimir that are you know guiding us through the process and you know helping to take the knowledge that you've acquired and and educate you know us on how we can apply you know what you've learned as we start to kind of wrap up today's conversation, I'm curious, what would you say your legacy roadmap is? Like, what, what is Casimir's legacy going to be? Obviously you're a li li living legend, but in, in you know, a hundred years from now. Well, ultimately I'm a self-taught engineer. Um, the information that comes with um, being self-taught is a type of knowledge. And I think my legacy would be empowering others to, to find strength in that, to find strength in you know, tackling a subject that can be um, overwhelming or daunting. But um, like you said, it's like kind of allowing yourself to be deep dived into the pool of, of information and seeking 
as a lifelong task, as a lifelong journey, as a lifelong skill set, I think ultimately that's what I want to encourage people to come into the field. We need more minds. We need more creatives. We need more people who are interested in social justice, social change. Um, that's really what ultimately blockchain and decentralization means to me is offering folks the opportunity to, um, you know, interact with um, a value layer that can be used um, for social good. Um, collective economics and, you know, being a conscious capitalist, you know, I think we definitely need more of folks like yourself in this world. And, you know, where can people find you? Where, like, how do they stay connected? I mean, ask Casimir, I'm asking, I'm asking. Yeah, um, so a couple of websites you can go to is nftyco.com. That stands for NFT You Can Own dot com and um that'll take you to um snigger cred storefront um it'll also um allow you to get in contact with me uh you could find me at founder at niftyco.com that's my email address personally given out right here on crypto Couch. so don't know any day your emails but um i'm willing to um to take on some new students and um yeah you can find me on social media ask casimir uh c-a-s-m-i-r is spelling of my name and also, um, I'd encourage you to go and sign up on Trap Chain. Uh, it's a new service I'm offering, which is kind of like a distro kit for all these decentralized um, music locations and um, decentralized gaming platforms, whereby which we basically give you a distribution um, model similar to distro kit, where if you want to get into these different marketplaces or these different gaming portals, um, we basically hold your hand and and walk you through that price process. And then we offer a white glove service to um, musicians and artists who, you know, want a little bit more, um, I guess, like curated approach. So yeah, you can find Trap Chain. I'll just spell it out because it's um, it's like a nerdy spelling. So it's, it's spelled T-R-A-P-C-H-A dot I-N. Trap okay. Chain. So, so we'll make sure that, you know, we, we, we share your, your handles and all that good stuff so folks can stay connected. But truth be told, we recruited you to Crypto Tutor. So if you really want to know, if you really want to build with Casimir, you could go to CryptoTutors.com because, you know, that's one of our, uh, you know, subject matter experts. <laughs> yeah, totals. The dot N stands for internet. I just want to add. For internet. We'll make sure that we put, um, we'll put all of the, the connection points to you um, and, and share it with folks. So, you know, I want to thank you for imparting your wisdom. You know, we, we talked about where people can find you. Clubhouse, Twitter. She's super active on, on Twitter. So make sure you shout her out. Tell her that you saw her on the Crypto Couch. Um, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the Crypto Couch, where you'll learn how to earn from subject matter experts and trailblazers like Casimir, who are leading us into the future. The industry moves at lightning speed. So you have to stay informed. But fret not. Crypto Tutors has your back. So subscribe and click like if you're picking up what we're putting down. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the experience. It's been awesome. Want to learn more? Visit CryptoTutors.com.